Grand Prix tournaments that I was afraid of my own shadow. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's, it's, you know, that's why I came to Paris. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a day of judgment. <laughs> Paris was the grand finale of the 1994 Intel World Series. The three clear favourites to win the Grand Prix were Moscow winner Vishwanathan Anand, New York winner Vladimir Kramnik, and London winner Vasily Ivanchuk. Kramnik was just one point ahead of Ivanchuk and Anand, who were tied for second. World champion Garry Kasparov had only an outside chance of claiming the overall Grand Prix. To achieve his goal, not only would he have to win in Paris, where Grand Prix points counted double, but he would have to trust that none of his main rivals would even reach the final. The first round saw the beginning of a miracle. After all the tension of the London victory, Vasily Ivanchuk's nerves finally failed here in Paris. His first round opponent, Ilya Smirin from Israel, held him to two uneventful draws, which brought them to the lottery of the shootout. Ivanchuk won the toss and selected the black pieces, meaning that a draw would be enough to send him through, though in accordance with the shootout rules he would only start with five minutes to Smirin's six. It was clear that the Ukrainian felt ill at ease from the opening, and as he dawdled nervously both his position and his time began to deteriorate. Under extreme pressure he simply froze. He might have been playing a postal game. Smirin couldn't believe his luck. He had only to make legal moves for Ivanchuk's time to run out. And as it was, he even landed a killer punch. Ivanchuk had blown it. With Kramnik and Kasparov in the top half of the draw, and Ivanchuk now out of the tournament, Vichy Anand's path to the final looked relatively clear. However, his first-round opponent, Anatoly Weisser, a Russian emigre now resident in Paris, had other ideas. Weisser came out on top in a theoretical duel in the first game, so Vichy found himself in a must-win situation in the second. Anand opened with his customary pawn to e4. Pfizer played c5, then knight f3, e6, first few moves absolutely normal, Sicilian defence, black captured on d4, white recaptured. Pfizer played knight f6, Anand defended the pawn with knight c3, and then came knight c6. Now this is Weiss's normal opening, it's inviting white to play into the, the highly complex Sveshnikov variation, which would begin with knight to b5, then d6, and bishop f4, e5, and bishop g5. Very complicated, and Weiser is a specialist in that opening. Anand thought he was being clever when he played his pawn to g3, just to sidestep all those complicated variations. But in fact, as Weisser revealed afterwards, he had prepared his next move specifically for this tournament. He played his queen out to b6, attacking the knight on d4. Very aggressive move. Anand captured on c6. Weisser recaptured with the b-pawn, so that strengthens his centre and opened the b-file. We'll see in a moment how critical, how crucial that is. And now Anand pushed on with his pawn to e5, then came knight to d5. And now Anand made a mistake. He played his knight into e4, which on, on the surface of it looks fine, just looking at that slightly weak d6 square. But then came a real shocker. Queen b4 check, attacking the knight, and of course checking the white king. So the knight was forced to come back to d2. And then came another excellent move, really rather surprising. Black's queen came to d4, attacking the pawn on e5. This is really rather uncomfortable for white. Anand defended the pawn with queen to e2. Now, if he has enough time to play the bishop to g2 and then castle on the king side, he'll be fine. But Weiss's next move was really very tricky, tricky indeed, and it cuts across White's plans. He played his rook to b8. Now, Anand hovered with his hand at this moment over the bishop on f1. But if he makes the natural move bishop to g2, then as he realised, 
Black plays the knight to c3. Fantastic move. And if pawn takes knight, then queen takes pawn. Now the rook in the corner is attacked. It can't move to a b1 because of simply rook takes b1. And so the rook in the corner is lost. Of course, it's possible for white to simply move the queen, but if, say, queen to d3, then queen takes pawn check. So it's necessary to keep defending the e-pawn, but the only satisfactory way to do that is queen e3, which is really rather ugly. Black simply captures the queen, pawn takes, and white's pawn structure has been shattered. Simply a move like knight a4 would keep up the pressure on white's position. Realising that bishop g2 would land him in great difficulties, Anand played knight b3. Now he thought he'd cut out all these tactics, but in fact he fell headlong into another one. Faisa snapped off the knight, rook takes b3, pawn takes rook, and then bishop b4 check. A really surprising combination. And white is completely lost in this position. If pawn to c3, then knight takes c3, pawn takes knight, and now a couple of moves to black, but bishop takes c3 is probably best. Bishop d2 forced, then bishop takes d2 check, queen takes d2, the rook in the corner goes, queen takes a1 check, and the pawn on e5 will fall as well after queen d1, queen takes e5 check. White is hopelessly lost here. Instead, Anand played the bishop to d2, but this was also hopeless. Fighter captured on d2, queen takes d2, and then he played queen e4 check, winning the rook in the corner. Anand struggled on with queen e2, queen takes h1, but he was completely lost. He's a piece down and really had nothing to show for it. After 30 moves, Anand was forced to resign and he was out of the tournament. In the remaining first round matches, Predrag Nikolic's solid approach was too much for the colourful Kazakh Vladislav Tkachev. And the young Israeli Vadim Milov beat Viktor Korchnoi. In the other half of the draw, Vladimir Kramnik kept his chances of winning the Grand Prix alive by defeating Judith Polgar. Alexei Vishmanovin dealt efficiently with Matthew's own hands. If all went well, he was on course for a semi final date with Vladimir Kramnik. The world champion was certainly on mean form in his first round match with Arbakov. This is the position after 14 moves of the King's Indian defence. Kasparov has gained some space on the King's side. This pawn on h4 is very nice indeed. It might threaten White's king. But Arbakov found counterplay on the queen's side. It's a very double-edged position. Arbakov played his pawn to a4, trying to open up lines. Kasparov tried to keep things closed by pushing the pawn to b4. The knight retreated to a2, attacking the b-pawn. Now it's possible for black just to defend the b-pawn, with a5, but then, for instance, bishop to b5 is possible, or perhaps rook to c1, immediately seizing c file. Instead, Kasparov played more aggressively. He played the knight in c5, threatening knight to b3, forking queen and rook. So Arbakov had to spend a move just protecting the b3 square and only then did Kasparov play the pawn to a5 now that the c5 is blocked. Arbakov's next move was highly controversial. He captured the knight on c5. Kasparov recaptured. Now in so doing he's weakened his whole king side. Those dark squares look very weak indeed but on the other hand he now has a strong pass d-pawn and possibilities to attack the pawn on c5. It's a really double-edged decision. He played the knight c1. Now that's threatening to come round 
perhaps to d3 or perhaps to b3 to attack the c-pawn, which is very weak indeed. Kasparov played the king to h7, an excellent move. He's preparing to bring the bishop to h6, getting counterplay on those weakened dark squares. The knight came to b3, attacking the c-pawn, and then bishop h6, attacking white's queen, which moved up to d3. Now Kasparov played his queen to d6, protecting the c-pawn, but also blockading white's d-pawn, preventing white's d-pawn from moving forward. White played bishop to b5. Now, in the long run, I think white is going to be able to win the c-pawn with perhaps bishop c6 and queen c4. has to prepare it. But Kasparov just thought, well, it's going to go anyway. He sacrificed it. c4. This is a tremendous move. Opening up the diagonal towards white's king. Now Kasparov played king g7. It looks like he's wasting time, but in fact, well, we'll see the purpose of this move in a moment. Bishop came to b5. Then queen b6 check. That's the reason why he sacrificed the c-pawn. King h1. And now black played rook h8. This is the reason why he shuffled to the side with a king. This sets up some really crude attacking ideas. The main one being, well... This isn't a forced variation, but it just shows you the, the idea behind black's moves. Knight g3 check, pawn takes knight, pawn takes pawn, and then bishop moves, and that's checkmate. That's Kasparov's main attacking idea, and somehow he's got to try and find a way to land with it before white actually gets somewhere on the queen side. Arbakov played his pawn forward to d6. Now let's work out what would happen if Kasparov played the knight into g3 immediately. Knight g3 check, when in fact Arbakov would not take that with the pawn. He'd capture with the knight. Knight takes g3, pawn takes knight, and now he could simply block the h-file by playing the pawn to h3. If the bishop comes to f4, threatening bishop takes h3, then d7 blocks the diagonal. And if queen e6, threatening rook takes h3, then pawn takes bishop, queen. So now the pawn on h3 is indirectly defended by the queen on c8. So rook takes queen, and then bishop d7, attacking black's queen, and again, indirectly defending the pawn on h3, saves the day for white, and indeed, he remains a piece up. So matters not at all clear. Kasparov is trying to land this enormous cheapo down the h-file, but Arbakov, in the meantime, is a pawn up on the queen side, and looks very strong. Kasparov played bishop to e6. Arbakov just dropped back with his bishop. He realises it's very important to get rid of that light square bishop. Kasparov exchanged. He was relieved that he could now capture the pawn on d6. Then came rook a to d1, queen e7. Now, it still looks as though Arbakov is doing very well indeed on the queen side. That pawn on a5 permanently under attack from the knight on b3. But then again, this bishop on h6, still very dangerous indeed, running around the dark squares. So extremely double-edged position. Arbakov played the queen to b5. Now I think that's a mistake because it allowed the bishop to come into e3. I think it would have been better to cover the e3 square with perhaps rook d3. Now came rook d7. The final mistake. Arbakov has overlooked Kasparov's grand cheapo here. Played knight g3 check. Now if pawn takes knight, as we've seen already, pawn takes pawn is checkmate from the rook on h8. 
Instead, Arbakov had to play knight takes g3, then came h takes g3. So if rook takes queen, then rook takes h2 is checkmate. So h3 is forced. And now Kasparov played a very simple move, queen to e6. I think that's the move that Arbakov must have overlooked. And now it's impossible to defend against rook takes h3, pawn takes rook, queen takes h3, checkmate. The tournament began with so many surprises, you know, and my only hope was not to continue it, you know. I think I, you know, I paid my contribution for the surprise in London, the food.